Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome. I think you all know me. My name is Tom Miles. I'm the dean of the law school. It is wonderful to welcome you to today's Ulysses S. and Margaret S. Schwartz Lecture. The, the Schwartz Lecture was established in 1974 to bring to our law school distinguished lawyers with experience in the academy, the practice of law, or public service, and to share their experiences and their perspectives and their ideas with our law school and our university community. Now, Judge Ulysses Schwartz was a longtime supporter of the university and of the law school. He began his legal career as a special assistant prosecutor in Chicago in 1910. And he then had a distinguished career that culminated in his service on the Illinois Supreme Court, where he served until 1973. Now, after his death in 1974, his family and friends got together and established this lectureship in his name. And the Schwartz family's connections with our law school run even deeper than that. Judge Schwartz's son, John, received his JD from our law school, and he, too, went on to become a judge. He served in the federal bankruptcy judge here in the Northern District of Illinois, including a span of 10 years as chief judge of that bankruptcy court. And over the course of the decades of the Schwartz Lecture, it has brought many distinguished lawyers to our law school, and it is terrific to add another accomplished and important lawyer and jurist to its ranks today. Our speaker, our Schwartz Lecturer, is Justice Luis Roberto Barroso. He is a justice of the Federal Supreme Court of Brazil, and he began his service on that court in 2013. Justice Barroso is also an accomplished academic. He is a professor of constitutional law at Rio de Janeiro State University. He holds an SJD from that university and an LLM from Yale. He has been a visiting scholar at Harvard Law School, and he has been a senior fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government for many years. He has written more than 12 books on constitutional law, and he has published many dozens of articles in academic venues all over the world, from, of course, Brazil, also the United States, the UK, France, Spain, Portugal, Mexico, Colombia. His most recent publications in the United States include In Defense of the Amazon, published last year in the Harvard Journal of International Law, and three years ago, Counter-Majoritarian, Representative, and Enlightened, The Role of Constitutional Courts in Democracies, and that appeared in the American Journal of Comparative Law. Today, Justice Barroso will speak on democracy, social media, and free expression. It is a great pleasure and an honor to introduce today's Schwartz lecturer, Justice Barroso. Thank you very much, Dean Thomas Miles. I greet everyone, Professor Tom Ginsburg. It's a pleasure and, and an honor to, to be here and to share with you all some thoughts and some ideas on this subject democracy, social media, and freedom of expression. Bom dia aos brasileiros que estão aqui. It's uh, actually uh, a pleasure to, to see you all. I, I have divided this uh, presentation in, in three parts. First part is dedicated to democracy, democratic recession, and authoritarian populism. Second part is dedicated to digital revolution. And the third part to social media and freedom of expression. So let's get started with part one. Constitutional democracy was the prevailing ideology of the 20th century. When we say constitutional democracy, we're kind of referring to a two-sided coin. And it means on one side, represented by democracy, it means popular sovereignty, free elections, and the rule of the majority. And on the other side, on the constitutional side, it means limited power, rule of the law, and protection of fundamental rights. So this is the scenario, this is the environment we're gonna be working on. Most constitutional democracy, 
as Professor Tom Ginsburg has showed, also have in their institutional arrangement a Supreme Court or a constitutional court, whose main role, or one of its main roles, is to arbitrate the tension that many times occur between democracy, that is, the will of the majority, and constitutionalism, constitutional values, represented basically by the rule of law and by the protection of fundamental rights. And furthermore, in this introductory uh, note, I like to say that contemporary constitutional democracies are made of votes, rights, and reasons, meaning that democracy is not limited to the moment of voting, it's not limited to the electoral moment, but it also requires the respect for everyone's fundamental rights, and more than that, it depends on an ongoing, on a permanent public debate that legitimizes the decisions that are taken over time. Although I said that constitutional democracy was the victorious ideology of the 20th century, we all recognize that something seems not to be going too well these days in a scenario that has been referred as democratic recession or democratic backsliding or abusive constitutionalism, competitive authoritarianism, illiberal democracy, autocratic legalism, among other derogatory terms. And these uh, expressions try to identify political processes that have gone on in countries like Hungary, Poland, Turkey, Russia, the Philippines, Venezuela, uh, Nicaragua, more recently uh, in Latin America, and El Salvador, and even consolidated democracies have faced difficulties and some degree of disbelief in institutions as we have seen in historical processes like what happened with the Brexit in, in the UK and with the invasion of the capital here in the United States. So what's happening in the world with uh, democracy? We are witnessing uh, an authoritarian and anti plural pluralistic and anti-institutional wave in different parts of uh, the world that has been referred as authoritarian populism, which poses serious risks to uh, democracy. Populism, as we all know, can be right-wing or left-wing, although in this current moment, the most dangerous threat to democracy has come from the far right with the racist, xenophobic, homophobic uh, discourse in, in different uh, countries. The, the hallmark of right-wing uh, populism, I think I, I can say, is the division of society in two antagonist groups. On one side, the people, pure, decent, and conservative, and on the other side, the elites, that are cosmopolitan, liberal, and often uh, corrupt. This is the basic playbook of uh, authoritarian uh, populism that quite often comes with a extremist behavior in the sense of intolerance uh, towards the other and denying rights to people that think different than, than me. I, I uh, don't want to spend much time in discussing the causes of the rise of authoritarian populism, but I'll be happy to talk about them in the debates if uh, anyone would like to uh, raise this uh, issue. What I want to say before ending this first chapter is that uh, pop authoritarian populism in most countries, they adopt the same strategy with three steps. The first one is establishing a direct communication with the masses, with their supporters, uh, more recently using social media. The second step is 
the bypass or the co-optation of what we call the intermediary institutions, like legislature, like uh, the press, like the uh, civil society organizations. And in the third place, a, the playbook of authoritarian populism include, uh, includes attacks on the Supreme Courts that have the role of limiting the power of majoritarian uh, politics. Uh, and authoritarian populism, besides attacking uh, Supreme Courts, they have this project of capturing the courts and filling the courts with submissive uh, judges. Uh, one, one thing that I uh, think it's, it's, it's important to highlight, when I was, when me and Tom, we, we were much younger, there was like an international leftist movement, like the international communist. Well, now there's a major right-wing network in, in the world behind this uh, populist uh, wave, as I said. The reason why I opened this chapter in a lecture that is dedicated to social media is because authoritarian uh, populism uses as one of its main tools disinformation campaigns, hate speech, conspiracy theories, slanders, usually conveyed through social media. So social media has become a very important instrument for the advance of populism. This label fake news, this improper label fake news, identify this sort of behavior, which is disseminating uh, misinformation or, or hate speech or, or uh, conspiracy theories. And that's very bad for democracy because that kind of behavior deceives voters in the first place, violates fundamental rights of people, usually people that are uh, attacked, and compromise free speech by tainting the public debate. And as I said at the outset, the public debate is an essential part of a functioning democracy. So this is the first, time, uh, first chapter of our conversation, and this is scenario we are living in. Democracy is the prevailing ideolo ideology of the 20th century. We are facing this democratic recession in many parts of, of the world, and we are watching the rise of authoritarian populism in different countries. Part two is dedicated to the digital revolution. The world is living under the third industrial revolution. The first has as its symbol, the first that started in the 18th century, has as its main symbol the use of steam as a source of energy. The second industrial revolution at the end of the 19th century has electricity as its main symbol. And the third revolution, the third industrial revolution, the digital revolution, has as its symbol the universalization, the massification of personal computers, of smartphones, and above all, the internet, connecting billion, billions of people throughout the, the world. And this digital revolution, it has changed the way we live, the way we do a research, the way we book a plane ticket, the way we listen to music. We all have a new vocabulary with words that identify applications and utilities that until a few day, days ago or years ago, we didn't even know or thought of and without which we cannot live anymore. I made a short list here. Google. So I want to tell the young people in, in the audience that there has been life on Earth before Google <laughs> appeared. 
And we all had to live without uh, being able to Google someone or, or, or some subject. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, this, are, this is all new for me and for Dean and Miles. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, ways for people that used to be lost as, as myself, uh, Spotify, Netflix, and for those who are single, there's also Tinder. So <laughs> we live in this brave new world of information technology, biotechnology, nanotechnology, neuroscience, quantum computing, the Internet of Things, autonomous cars, 3D printing, algorithm, a word that we never heard until a couple of years ago, has become the most important concept of our time. More than that, the most valuable companies, a few years ago, a few decades ago maybe, were the ones that produced uh, oil, like Exxon and, and Shell, or made cars, like Ford and General Motors, or major equipment, like General Electric. None of them figure as the most valuable companies these days. The most valuable companies are Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, with their new names, uh, Alphabet and, and, and Meta. So this is the revolution we are living in at, 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 at this moment, with all the benefits and all the challenges that this revolution uh, brings, and the risks, uh, the risks that involve uh, the risks of a world that could come to be dominated by artificial intelligence with the opacity of the algorithms, with the discriminatory effects of the algorithms, and the risk of singularity, which is the machines taking over. We have, we live through the risks of genetic engineering that promises to cure many diseases, and that's very important, but with the risks of eugenics or the temptation of playing God and trying to make creatures brighter, stronger, more good-looking, and increasing inequality in, in, in the world, and the risks of the abuse in the use of the internet, which is the subject that brings us here uh, to, to discuss. And I want to focus from now on on this internet, on the subject internet, social media, and freedom of expression. The internet revolutionized the world of interpersonal and social communications, democratizing access to information, to knowledge, and to the public sphere. Before the internet, the dissemination of opinions, ideas, and facts relied to a great extent in the traditional media, in the professional press, television, radio, and newspapers. So everything that would reach the public sphere had to pass the editorial control of the editors of these means, of the television uh, news or, or, or radio news or, 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 or the newspapers. So there was a minimum control of veracity, civility, and authenticity of whatever got to the public space. Well, with the social media, this filter has disappeared. So at the same time that the internet has democratized access to information, knowledge, and to the public sphere, it also represented an avenue 
through which hate, disinformation, and theory uh, and, and conspiracy theories can circulate with the websites, with the personal blogs, and uh, very notably with uh, social media. When I say social media, I'm talking about Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, TikTok, and messaging apps like uh, WhatsApp and Telegram. WhatsApp's not so popular in, in, in America, but it's the most popular uh, messaging app in, in, in the world. Uh, I, I, I don't know exactly the reason why it didn't become popular here. Uh, but as I was saying, one of the most striking developments of the digital revolution is the rise of social media. And it has, as I mentioned, revolutionized interpersonal and social communications. In Brazil, where I live, the two best-selling newspapers sell 300,000 copies per day. The New York Times might sell um, 1 million, maybe 1.5 million uh, news issues per day. Facebook has 3 billion accounts. YouTube has 2.5 billion accounts. WhatsApp has 2 billion users. So one thing that we should highlight here is the change in scale. We moved from a few thousand to many millions in access to knowledge, information, and for the circulation of ideas. In, in Brazil, where I live, 79% of the population have as their main source of information WhatsApp, which is a messaging uh, app, television that was the star of our generation, it's responsible for only 50% of people's uh, information. YouTube, 49%. Facebook, 44%. News sites, 38%. And people like me that still read newspapers on paper, we are only 8%, Dean. And you should see the face that my kids look at me when I'm reading actual paper when I have it in, in, in my hands. So the, the most serious uh, consequences, I, I would say, of this digital revolution and the role of the internet and, and of social uh, media is first, the unfiltered circulation of disinformation. Second, what we can call the tribalization of life, which is the internet and the social media uh, help the formation of groups that only talk to themselves uh, in so like echo chambers, groups that for only talking to themselves do not share other people's views and become every time more polarized and more radical. So we are living in a world where these groups behave with a confirmation bias, which is consuming only the information that matches what they already think. And when you only talk to people that think like you, you not only become polarized and indifferent to other ideas, but you also start to make your discourse every time more radical. And the third observation I, I would like to make is that the rise of the internet, the digital uh, revolution, brought a crisis in the business model of the professional press. Throughout the world, in Brazil, in America, in Europe, in other parts of the, the world, hundreds of major publications have uh, closed their doors, fired journalists, and lost their uh, relevance. And this has a very powerful impact on democracy. Because the press in most countries is a private business. But it's more than a private business. It's very important for the public interest. It's very important because the professional press creates an environment 
of common facts. They are shared by people generally. So life is made of people that understand the reality, understand objective facts in the same way. Then you can have a different opinion. The problem that is happening in, in the world is that people do not differ anymore only in their opinions. They differ, they differ in, in the facts they, they believe. And each group builds its own narrative of facts. And they don't share a common objective uh, reality. They just cannot accept the uh, same facts. And that's very dangerous. This is a blue pen. After that, you can say, I don't like blue, I prefer black. Or you can say, I think it's ridiculous that you still use a pen in the world of personal computers. You can have any opinion about my pen. But if you say that this is a tire, we just lose our capacity of dialoguing, of communication. So we need to have an environment where people can share the basic facts. And after that, you can have your opinion, you can develop your opinion, you can disagree. But if you can't disagree on the fact, if you can't agree on the facts, it's very difficult to establish a communication. And violence usually stems from the lack of communication. And then you grow very intolerant uh, about whoever thinks uh, differently. Uh, and one uh, last observation I would like to make. The social media, as I said, is the most important source of information for most people these days. But there is one point there. They don't produce information. They don't produce knowledge. They don't produce news. So if we lose the professional press, we lose the production of content. So it's very important to think the relationship between social media and the press, because what happened was that most advertising moved from the press, the professional press, the traditional media, to the digital media. So they're going bankrupt. And so we are going to lose the companies, the professional press that produce uh, news. That's something we should care about, because as I said, that's not just a private business affected by a disruptive innovation. We are talking about something that I deem essential for a democracy, a professional press that can establish with some control over the uh, authenticity what reaches uh, the public. Now we move on to the subject of the regulation of social media. When it all started, Some time ago, when the internet started and then the social media developed, there was this belief that it should be free, open, and unregulated. That was the main discourse. The internet is going to be a libertarian space of life. We don't want the state there. We don't want any regulation. This is a totally free uh, environment. Over time, however, this belief had to cede to reality. And these days, there is a consensus that the internet and the social media needs to be regulated. And it needs to be regulated in, in different areas, in different levels. To start with, it needs regulation on the economic level to avoid uh, to apply antitrust law, to protect consumers, to protect, uh, protect copyright, and to establish fair taxation. These uh, major companies, when they started, you wouldn't find them anywhere. They would say, I'm in, in Dubai, I'm in Brazil, I'm in, in, in India, and they would just escape any sort of taxation. So you need to regulate, because these are the most valuable companies 
on earth and they need to be taxed just like any other company. Secondly, you need to regulate internet and social media to protect privacy that has become a main asset in our time. These digital platforms, they gather an in incredible amount of information about us. They know where we live. They know the name of our partners, of our kids, how much money we make. But more than that, they know the last book I bought, the last research I made, the last plane ticket that I purchased. So this information has to be handled with care and they cannot use that kind of information without my authorization. So most countries now have a legislation to protect personal data from improper use by digital platforms. And now we are starting to face a more complex issue regarding privacy. With the advance of information technology, biotechnology, and neuroscience, the science of the brain, they, these platforms, they can only, they can know not only what are my interests so that they can uh, micro-target the publicity, the advertising, but they can manipulate what we like and what we feel. So there is a new fundamental right being built and being discussed, which is cognitive liberty, so that they don't influence my will without my authorization, or my feelings without my authorizations, or my desires. That, that's a new, whoever's seeking some subject to write about, this is something I would be interested if I were where you are. The developments in the science of the brain and how they can manipulate our will, not according to our own interests, according to their interests or the people that they are selling this uh, project, uh, project to. So it needs regulation in the economic level, as I mentioned, to protect privacy. And uh, last but not least, to fight inauthentic behavior for content control in certain cases and to establish platform liability. And this is uh, the most difficult topic, or I think this is one of the most difficult topics we are dealing in the whole world, in the whole democratic world. How to balance free speech, which is an asset that we want to preserve with the necessity, imperative necessity, of regulating authentic, inauthentic behavior and uh, improper content in, in the internet. When I say uh, inauthentic uh, behavior, uh, well, let me give one word uh, on free speech first that we all want to preserve because it's important for uh, many reasons, for the search of the possible truth in an open society. It's very important for human dignity. People have the necessity of manifesting themselves, their personality. And in third place, because it's essential for democracy, the circulation of information and, and news. That, that's why striking a balance between regulation and free speech is, is very delicate and very important. What kind of behavior that we need to regulate on, 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 the, on the internet on, and on social media? First, inauthentic behavior, which is the use of automated systems like bots or like fake profiles or hiring trolls, provocateurs to amplify a lie. That's the main problem in the social media. Because if someone posts uh, something saying kerosene oil is good to fight COVID and he has 20 followers, that's bad. And it's going to hurt or it could hurt 20 people potentially. But if that fake news is amplified and reaches uh, or, and reach thousands of people, 
then you have a public health issue, a public health problem. So inauthentic behavior means the amplifying of misinformation or disinformation or of lies or of hate speech or of conspiracy theories because then you reach thousand millions of people and this is used not only to harm people not only to advance political interests but also to drown the information you don't want to appear if there is something in the news that a group doesn't want to be seen by many people. They just create a fake news and they amplify it and they drown the truthful information so that it doesn't reach the public. Uh, so we need to regulate the internet to fight inauthentic behavior, to fight uh, illegal content like terrorism, child abuse, uh, incitement to crime and violence, hate speech, which is a America treats it in, in a different way than, than most part of the world, uh, the selling of illicit uh, substances. And finally, we need to fight disinformation. In, in Brazil, we have elections coming, and disinformation has become a major problem that is damaging dramatically democracy. So if in the eve of the elections, you distribute fake news by saying candidate X is inciting his followers to invade evangelical churches and burn it down, this could affect in a very relevant way the outcome of the election, and that's just, just not true. So how do authorities deal with this flooding of fake news in the electoral processes? And more critically, and that's pretty true for, for the United States, how you avoid that foreign powers try to meddle with your elections here and try to influence, not according to American interests, but according to their own interests, be it Russian, Chinese, or whatever. So democracies are trying to find a way to protect themselves and to protect values including to protect free speech, because deliberate lie and misinformation is not free speech to be protected, but we all fear censorship and we are looking for this uh, balance. I am coming to, to an end because I, leave, I want to leave some time for, for debate, but most democracies got rid of state censorship. And now I'm saying that the platforms should not convey any sort of information, but we don't want them to become private censors either. So we are all trying to think of criteria that should govern the behavior of uh, digital platforms in moderating content. Moderating meaning the power to ban a, a content, to, to uh, amplify a, a content or uh, to uh, advertise that that content might be by labeling the content that this could be uh, untruthful. So uh, plat digital platforms in moderating content should uh, behave with transparency. Their terms of use need to be clear and understandable. Some sort of due process must exist, uh, a minimum reasoning for banning some content. And in the third place, uh, fairness is uh, required. You cannot ban or, or reduce the scope of a post, for example, uh, based on uh, gender orientation or, or political preference or race or, or religion that wouldn't be accepted. Those are illegitimate uh, elements to discriminate. And what's interesting, there's no way the platforms can control what circulates. We're talking about millions or billions of posts daily. So they try to monitor that minimally with algorithms. And it, it's interesting because 
there's some uh, egregious mistakes ba made by these algorithms. One of them was a breast cancer campaign was removed for uh, S pornography or new DT. And that very famous picture of a girl fleeing from an apalm attack in, in Vietnam was removed for being a child abuser or, or, or uh, pedophilia, which is uh, the consequence of having not humans, but algorithms taking care of this. But there's no way that you can control it without algorithms. It's just not possibly to, possible to do it uh, uh, by, by men or, or women. Uh, so how to regulate? The basic idea is that there must be some state regulation, some basic framework requiring transparency, due process, and, and fairness. And, uh, but we don't want too much state meddling with free speech. So besides state regulation, there must be self-regulation which is established in the terms of use of these uh, companies. And there is what has been called regulated self-regulation, which is even the application of state legislation and self-regulation that's done by the companies with a outside supervision by a body, independent body, non-governmental, with representatives of government of the consumers and of the industry to monitor how things are going. Finally, there is a major discussion in, in the world right now on what kind of liability should the platforms have for messages they are posted on, on online. Uh, of, of course, strict liability couldn't work. They would just go bankrupt because they cannot control what's being posted. So we are basically talking about two hypotheses of subjective liability. One that established after a private notification and one that established after a judicial notification. So in, in countries uh, like Germany and in the recently approved Digital Services Act in the European uh, union, if a party notifies the platform that certain content is illegal or violates uh, his or her right and he wants it or she wants it removed, if the platform doesn't remove after this private notification, it becomes liable if a court of justice understands that it should have been removed. That's what they are uh, adopting in, in Europe. In, in Brazil, there's legislation that uh, opted for this subjective liability after a, the first judicial order, the first judicial notification, even if, it, if, it, if it's a provisional order. And we are kind of satisfied with it. The only exception is revenge porn, the use of private images uh, online with, without authorization that should be removed uh, immediately. And finally, we're talking about regulation, but there is a very important role here for uh, society. Despite all the efforts by governments and by uh, the, the platforms, if we want to preserve the internet as a healthy public sphere that will depend on the attitudes and demands of society. So we are all talking about media education and awareness of society in dealing with the news and not passing on what's not uh, acceptable and try to avoid that the internet becomes the, the domain, I, I uh, think I could say, of provocateurs and not good citizens, of radicals and not moderate citizens, and the risk that the social media brings that our people are judged immediately without due process and no reputation can survive once it's slandered in, in, in the internet. So my conclusion before we 
move on to the Q&A, is uh, the internet and the digital uh, revolution was able to democratize access to information, knowledge, and to the public sphere. That's very good. That's changing the course of history. But we must be aware that it can be abused, violating fundamental rights, and violating the democracy, and thus confronting inauthentic behavior and illegal content is mandatory. But this regulation must be proportional and adopt uh, proper procedural measures, and media education and awareness of people of good faith, which fortunately is the majority in, in the world, is, is mandatory. We abide by the law, not because there is a cop behind us, but we because we, are, we have the conscience that this is the right thing uh, to do. So we need this in dealing with social media and with uh, internet to make the, the internet, the virtual world, I would say, a positive and, and, and constructive envir environment for new technologies and for a better world. Thank you very much. Well, there is a first issue there, which is the difficulty of defining this information, especially in the public debate, in a heated public debate, that, that's very difficult. When I, I was the head of the electoral court in the, in the past elections, and we entered partnerships with all major digital platforms, and we all agreed that they would uh, fight the inauthentic behavior. So when you uh, notice that bots and, and fake profiles or provocateurs are uh, acting, you would just remove that content. Uh, that worked fairly well. And in second place, we established a direct channel with them to inform immediately uh, that some misinformation was on, on, the, on the internet. But what we did was to protect the democratic system and the credibility of the system. This year, the electoral court is trying with great difficulty to fight misinformation between the candidates and, and the campaigns. And that's very difficult to do. And I think no matter how much you try, you, you can, they, they just approved the resolution yesterday because when, when there is a court order to remove content, it should be uh, complied with in, in 24 hours. They, they changed that yesterday for two hours I think they're, they're doing their best, but the best is insufficient. So uh, without uh, society awareness of not passing on lies, without not passing on information that you, you are not sure of its authenticity, uh, without society uh, cooperation, we, you, you just, we just can't handle that well enough. So, this is a problem of our time. And I, I think whoever says that you can uh, eliminate fake news through court orders will be, if not lying, dreaming. Related to that, I guess I'm curious about um, who's reporting to the electoral board. Is it users of these platforms, <coughs> or do the platforms themselves have to develop mechanisms in response to the electoral board's um, Role. And then um, I have another question, which is that I'm curious why you advocated for physical press over um, digital or over like kind of more uh, the digital forms of information that have emerged in the last uh, couple decades. Um, and like whether that is related to the specific context of uh, Brazil or uh, and how you find an example for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, well the, the first point is usually the opposing candidates uh, file a complaint or we have an institution in Brazil which is the public ministry and which is like a procurator general that has an electoral office and they can say this is unreasonable and, and ask for removal so the 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 courts don't act ex officio you need to be properly uh, provoked properly sought I, I didn't quite get your second point 
Can you repeat it? Um, well, I mean, I guess, so I'm very, I don't have that much understanding of surgeons, so please don't um, get mad at me. But, um, yeah, so um, I know that generally misinformation can be a problem in Latin America because, especially through the internet, especially because um, of, like, kind of, Foreign forces like China, like planting information and controlling the news narrative, and I was wondering if that contributed to um, an argument for maintaining the commercialization of physical press over primarily getting commercialization news of of like physical press, like physical newspapers, you know, oh, okay. by the newsstand as opposed to um, just information online. And um, if if that's why you're making the argument, then um, if that's based in like an example of a case that you've handled or, or something that you've worked with. Well, first, don't worry that you don't understand much of this subject because nobody does. <laughs> we are all learning. And the fake, fake news are not a problem in Latin America. It's a world, it's a global problem. And you're going to have elections here and you're going to have these very same problem again. It's a problem that has been increasing, and I, I think that we should all uh, consider, as I said before, the rescue of the professional press and trying to find way, ways to share the revenues that moved entirely to, to the digital platforms without a public sphere of common facts, democracy is in, in danger. Yes, over here. Hi. Uh, so you seem really concerned about populism, and it seems to bother you that regular Brazilians are using social media to support populist candidates. To me, that sounds exactly like democracy. Why do you see that as like contradictory to the idea of democracy? I don't have. Well, I I might dislike populism, but that's not my problem. My problem is authoritarian populism, and their strategy in, in, I'm not talking about Brazil right now, but in, in other places of the world, of disseminating fake news and, and conspiracy theories and slanders as a strategy to get to power. Uh, if you have a chance, there is a book by an, a, an American journalist, and Applebaum, called Twilight of Democracy, in which she tries to show, and she's a conservative woman, she tries to show how in, in countries like Poland, Hungary, and Italy, the conservative camp was captured by the far right. So, and, and to be clear, and that's a very good, important question, the democracy has room for liberals, for conservatives, and, and for, for uh, the problem is liberal in, in, in Brazil means something different than here, uh, has has room for any ideology that's not violent. Uh, but it doesn't have room to whoever wants to destroy it. So that, that, that's the limit. So the fact that I dislike populism uh, is, is probably my problem. But if it becomes authoritarian, it, it, it is an institutional problem. So if you watch processes like what happened in, in Hungary, for example, it's a state that became progressively more authoritarian, and the same happened in, in Turkey. And especially when pop, populist leaders are re-elected, democracy runs more risk. Uh, but my problem, or my major problem, is not with populism, it's with authoritarianism. Although I think that populism, th there are many meanings for the word populism, but the meaning that I'm using here Populism has a flaw, an original flaw. When you divide the country in we and them, and you say that we, the people, pure, conservative, decent, and them, the elites, corrupt, liberal, cosmopolitan, uh, I think there are two mistakes there. First, in a democracy, no one is the only representative of democracy. People is plural. If we discuss here in this room, people have different views, and we are all people. So there's not one only legitimate representative of people like the populist leader attempts to, to show. And second, elites are not homogeneous either. 
Of course, there are bad elites and in Brazil and in all over, very extractive elites that try to put the, the state and, 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 and the government to serve their own interests and that those elites must be fought against. But every country needs a, a intellectual elite, a business elite, and you need elites in, in, in the public service. So the use of the, words, the word elite uh, is also improper. So my difficulty with populism is that it's a strategy that divides, and that's bad. But you might like that. But authoritarianism deprives me of my right of defending my point of view, and that's, that's what I consider unacceptable. So I usually say authoritarian populism. And the, most, the, the problem is with the authoritarian, although I don't like populism either. <laughs> yes, right here. Uh, how do you see the future of constitutional courts in, in this environment, and especially regarding the speed that our society are requiring? Can you can you repeat the final part? The the speed? Yeah, because our side is that now society most of all, especially in Brazil, the constitutional court stands to take a little longer to uh, approach the issues of Oh okay. Well, the the future of the of constitutional courts in, in, in countries where authoritarian populism prevails is uh, object of some concern, I would say. Because when they divide the world in us and them, the elites, constitutional courts are the best representative for those elites because you're usually talking about people that, you know, studied and, and studied abroad in, in the case of Brazil many times. So it's, it's a typical representative of the elites and it's a wonderful target. And it's happened. Uh, now in, in Brazil, you have people that love us and people that hate us. And uh, probably in both cases for the wrong reasons. <laughs> so uh, uh, th there is a problem with populism and courts and, and again Hungary and Turkey and Venezuela and more recently El Salvador. Uh, all those uh, countries have shown problems with uh, populist leaders meddling with, with, with the courts. Uh, and the, the judicial process deciding cases is all over the world, a process that takes time. But uh, surprisingly, in, in Brazil, we can be very fast because unlike here, when, uh, where a case can only reach the court in, through an appeal, in, in Brazil, in many cases, you can reach the court through a, a direct action and then we can act very quickly. Uh, but I must acknowledge that sometimes the judiciary is pretty slow. I want to ask you a, a question about hyperpartisanship on social media, which is very similar, similar but slightly different from disinformation. It seems like markets can be a really bad way for people to choose social media because, as you said, there's just enormous confirmation bias. People just go to the media companies that they want to read and don't expand their views. But any other alternative, like state-run media, seems way worse. So are we just stuck in this system that's not very good with no better alternatives? Well, that, that's why I was saying that we should recover some space for the professional press so that we can have common facts. I have read some suggestions by, by American authors, uh, actually, that Facebook, for example, should have before, because what, what they do, they have algorithms that select things that will please you. And so you only get advertising and information that you are uh, comfortable with. And I've read some ideas that they should have a basic common uh, feed at, at the beginning with basic facts uh, so that people would share at least that minimum amount of information. I, I've read this. I haven't studied or, or you know, uh, thought that this is a wonderful idea, but it could be. So the, the concepts... Uh, uh, Underlying this, I think it's important. We need to have common facts, minimum common facts, like Russia invaded uh, Ukraine. That's a fact. After that, you can have different interpretations. But if you, like, I'll, I'll give you a Brazilian example that strikes me. The Amazon uh, in 
2012, in 2012, the deforestation uh, reached 4,000 square kilometers. We go by kilometers, sorry. Uh, now it reached 12,000 in 2022, 12,000. That's a fact. So after that, you can say, I think the forest is a liability, not an asset, and I don't see any problem in having it torn down. Or you can say, that's unacceptable, we need to preserve, and we need a def deforestation zero. These are opinions. But you cannot say, as it has been said, that the forest has never been so protected, because that's just not true. So one thing that I think is very important, we should make lying wrong again. Lying is not a legitimate, sorry, uh, I don't, don't want to meddle in American politics. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's what I mean that we, we need to do. And it, it's, it's not a political issue, it's an ethical issue. Lying is just not a legitimate strategy to do business or to advance any sort of idea so I, I think we need to seek means to create objective facts again so that people can disagree as they will always disagree on their ideas, on their opinions. So when people say there's polarization, polarization there has always been in, in this country from, from the beginning, in the succession of George Washington, you already have the, the Federalists of John Adams and the Republicans with Thomas Jefferson, that's part of life. People don't agree in everything, and it's the good part of life is that people don't agree with me in everything. It would be a very boring life. Or in, in, in France, after the French Revolution, you had the left and the right, according to their position regarding the crown. So the problem is not that you have polarization, that you have different views. The problem is dealing with lies and false narratives. And, and worse than that, this unacceptable vision that if you think in a different way than I do, you ought to be serving an indecent cause that can't be uh, nominated. And uh, so we need to rescue this respect and, and concern for people that think differently, and people pose their arguments on the table instead of offending each other. And uh, we, I think we, we are fighting what I, I would say like a civilizatory problem, and an ethical problem here, rather than a political question. Well, we have more questions than there is time for, which is always the sign of an enormously successful Schwartz Lecture. So thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the justice.